the poor, the farmer, the poor, the farmer, brr, pa, pa, brr, pa. So a lot of people have been reaching out to me recently, basically just asking what the fuck is going on in South Africa. And in this video, we will address that and much more. In fact, we are going to take a quick deep dive beyond the shallow shit they try to sell us into deeper topics like race baiting, slavery, why blaming white people is not the solution, BRICS, NATO, and who the real enemy is. That escalated quickly. The political party is called the EFF or the Economic Freedom Fighters and they are very ironically holding their 10th anniversary at the first National Bank Stadium which is in fact part of the corrupt economic system that they allegedly stand against. We have no sympathy when it comes to APSA and FNB. They are the most racist banks. Now in this video, yes, they are literally singing Kill the Burr which represents white Afrikaans people which are like descendants of German, Dutch, and French people from the past, which we will address further momentarily. The capacity of the stadium is 95,000 people, which although that sounds like a very large number, there are over 60 million people in South Africa, guys, which is to say the people in that video represent around 0.1% of the population, which to put in South Africa terms is folk all. But if you really want to stretch it, the EFF's total membership around the country is just over 1 million, which although sounding like a massive figure, is around 1.6% of the population. And while that may still seem very high to some, historically high levels of unemployment, poverty and suffering have made very easy recruiting grounds for hateful ideologies like what took place in Nazi Germany. And yet most South Africans have in fact experienced much higher levels of unemployment and suffering and yet still found the strength to remain kind and humane. It's too bad. I want to buy water. You want to buy water? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's too bad. Check what's in here. Oh. Check what's in here. Yeah. Can you just help me with extra three rand? I just want to buy for cheap. Would you like, would you like a three rand from us? Yeah. How much do you need? Three I rand. Just, just three rand, just to want make to buy a cheese. To, to make a ten? Yeah. So give me that, you take that. All right, thank you. What you have done, you must continue to do to others. Here's my gift for you. Count how much is that. Wow, man. Yes, why this is you, not brother, fake. why are you doing this, man? It's because I care about people. I've been poor before. God loves you. Yeah. So did you eat today? No. You didn't eat? Okay, take this. How are you? You're good. Okay, what are you doing? I'm uh, looking for scrap. Yes, your bread. Buy it, buy it, buy it. Yes, yes, some oh, Thanks, now I can go and pitch my idea. Thanks. Yeah. I do my idea and I go and buy food. Yes, yeah, just take this extra one. Yeah. Buy a donkey, my baby. What yes. day you? And this is yours. This is your Christmas, man. I think you would have yeah, <laughs> stop it. <laughs> Don't cry, man. You're gonna make me cry. Eh? Yeah, listen, brother. I know it's bad, eh? <laughs> take, take this one. <laughs> take this one. Are you serious? I'm serious. That is yours. Yeah. Take this one. <laughs> yes. That is yours, brother. Yeah. Love you, brother. My point in sharing this is the situation in South Africa is far more complex than the rest of the world sees. And the EFF, although they have been ignorantly referred to as the black body of South Africa, in fact only reflects a tiny minority of black people's views in the country. Now that's not to say we shouldn't speak out against this insanity. Threatening to kill innocent people based on ethnicity is very obviously not okay. Now the argument being made by apologists and the EFF is that this is a song of remembrance of the past struggle against apartheid and therefore shouldn't be taken literally. But the reality is that the EFF have a history of promoting division and racism in South Africa. In 2016 for example, then EFF member Thabo Mabocha called for all white people to be literally and I quote hacked and killed. In 2000 
2018, the leader Julius Malema claimed that most Indian people hate black people. Majority of Indians hate Africans. Majority of Indians are racist. In 2018, he made these controversial comments. We've not called for the killing of white people, at least for now. I can't That's... guarantee the future. Yeah, but I mean, you'd understand somebody watching that, especially as it gets shared on Twitter, they freak ah, out. It sounds like a genocidal ah, call. Ah, cry babies. I'm saying to you, not under my leadership will we call for the slaughter of white people. I don't know who's coming after me. I will not speak for them. And just a few weeks after this fear-mongering interview, when asked on Twitter if he was behind four murders, he ambiguously replied, maybe, maybe not. 2020, EFF member Anthony Machumba was exposed as the true face behind the infamous Tracy Zoll Twitter account, which constantly posted racist and degrading tweets against black people in South Africa. And this is also not the first time that the EFF have been in the news about this controversial song. But it's not just the EFF that promotes this divisive propaganda either, guys. During 2016, in 2017, the prestigious British public relations firm Bell Pottinger embarked on a massive propaganda campaign of race baiting in South Africa, where as summarized by The Guardian, they used traditional and social media including a fake blog and Twitter account to basically blame wealthy white people and stir up public anger about and I quote white monopoly capital and economic apartheid. This was essentially a tactic to distract the public's attention away from the corruption of the then presidency of Jacob Zuma and his close ties to the infamous Gupta family. And I'd like to be very clear here guys, the people behind this propaganda campaign were themselves white. And while this sort of propaganda has continuously been spread to incite division and hatred between everyday black people and everyday white people, the black South African government has continued to work with the same powerful white families and corporations that were in fact instrumental during apartheid and never ever fined or forced to pay reparations. But me, whose parents grew up poor during apartheid, who never voted for or agreed with that corrupt government, I must now bear the moral responsibility of that corrupt government's past decisions and my child and his children and so on and so forth. Wow, that sounds like a really good deal. But I think I got a better one. When has a government ever, in the history of the world, ever represented the true will of the people? Never. They are corrupt, they are manipulative, they are inhumane, and they don't give a shit about the will of the people. Not now, and not then. And the white people that did have the courage to seriously speak out against the apartheid government, they were just thrown in jail or murdered, guys. Dr. Neil Agard was tortured and killed by the police, Ruth First was bombed by government assassins, Rick Turner was shot and died in his 13 year old daughter's arms, and David Webster and Anton Lebowski were assassinated by a government sponsored death squad called the Civil Cooperation Bureau. And the exact same thing happened in the US. John Brown was hung, William Moore was gunned down, James Reeb was beaten to death, Congressman James Hines was assassinated, Viola Luiza was shot, and the list just goes on and on. So be sensible guys and ask yourself how many of you would be willing to sacrifice your life or be thrown in jail like Julian Assange protesting against corruption? Exactly, just because you aren't willing to die or go to prison for the rest of your life it doesn't automatically mean you support the corrupt decisions of your government. In other words, for those who might still be a bit confused about the very simple point I'm trying to make here, Blaming everyday people or an entire skin color for the choices of essentially what is an extremely manipulative minority of corrupt governments and psychopaths that use deception and propaganda to manipulate and exploit society, whether that be today or 300 years ago, is obviously irrational and illogical. And then blaming the ancestors of these people is just, it's completely insane. If we want true justice, then we need to point the finger at the powerful families that were actually instrumental in these inhumane institutions and in fact continue to manipulate and exploit society to this very day. Now that we got that shit out of the way, I want to get back to the bigger picture here. Long before black and white even encountered each other, both races were being enslaved and exploited by their own kind. And unsurprisingly, when black slave traders and white slave traders finally encountered one another for the first time, they joined forces in what became the Atlantic slave trade we know so well today. 
In fact, according to a 2010 article from Professor Henry Louis Gates, 90% of African slaves shipped to the so-called New World were first enslaved by other Africans and then sold to Europeans. As he explains, without complex business partnerships between African elites and European traders and commercial agents, the slave trade to the New World would have been impossible, at least on the scale it occurred. Or to put it another way, in the words of former slave and brilliant writer Frederick Douglass, the savage chief on the western coast of Africa who for ages have been accustomed to selling their captives into bondage and pocketing the ready cash for them will not more readily see and accept our moral and economical ideas than the slave traders of Maryland and Virginia. We are therefore less inclined to go to Africa to work against the slave traders than to stay here to work against it. In other words, the problem is not about skin color guys, but the ideology of elitism and exploitation. Now in more modern history, another great black leader that understood this was Fred Hampton, who despite having his identity hijacked by politics today, warned the black community about the popular illusion that white people are the problem and all that's needed is black leadership. Papa Doc in Haiti. Papa Doc in Haiti hated everything white. Man, you couldn't put this white paper in front of Papa Doc's face. Seeing but he moved all the white people out and he took over to be yeah, a president. He did. Because no education. Oh, yeah. And the people that had been educated, they just said that we don't hate the motherfucker oh. white people, we hate the oppressor, whether he be white, black, brown, or yellow. Now I know Cousin Fred was a fast talker, but what he's specifically talking about is the rise to power of a guy by the name of Papa Doc Duvalier in Haiti. You see, Papa Doc convinced all the black people that had been getting oppressed for just centuries by white people, all the way back to Christopher Columbus, that all that was needed was to get rid of the white people and instead give him power. But once that happened, Papa Doc declared himself a dictator for life. He stole millions from the people and set up a death squad to target people opposed to him known as the Taunton Makuts, and they executed tens of thousands of Haitians, guys. And then in a move of extraordinary deception, Papa Doc turned around and he worked with the white American government, who reportedly, through the US Marines, in fact helped train his death squad, the Taunton Makuts. With all that said, as somebody who studies the ruling class, I've become aware that they love to promote the views of influential black leaders that spread hatred and division, but they silence and even assassinate black leaders that promote unity against invariably what is a mutual threat. Now, of course, one of the more famous examples of this was the aforementioned Fred Hampton, who was assassinated by the government. And why they want to get rid of me because I'm saying something that might wake up some other exploited people and some other oppressed people, black people and white poor people and red poor people and Puerto Rican poor people and Latin American Puerto Rican people of uh, poor people of all descents. And if all these people ever get together, then these pigs that are exploiting us, we'll be able to run into the lake. That's why they want to get rid of us. But little do people know that central to the original Black Panther Party itself was the promotion of racial unity against the establishment and a much greater enemy. You know, our party evolved to have a broader class analysis rather than a race-only analysis. We understood how to look at the broader class analysis of what was happening. You'd work in coalitions with over 38 different organizational groups in the United States of America. Black groups, all our white left radical friends, some 10 or 12 of those organizations, all our young Hispanic brothers and the Puerto Rican brothers, young Brown Berets brothers, uh, the young lords, the young Chinese Asians, and then and, and AIM American Indian Movement. This is what the power structure was afraid of. The motto of the Black Panther Party was all power to all the people. Not all power to some of the people, all the people. The all power to all people. We say white power to white people. White power to white people. Brown power to brown people. Brown power to brown people. Yellow power to yellow people. Yellow power to yellow people. Black power to black people. Black power to black people. X power to those that we left out. And much like Fred Hampton, members such as Mark Clark were outright murdered by the government or wrongfully imprisoned like Alma Geronimo Pratt or Albert Woodfox who was forced into more than four decades of solitary confinement, reportedly the longest in US history. Compare that to an organization like the so-called new Black Panther Party, so-called because the original Black Panther Party members make it very clear that there is no formal association. The existing new Black Panther Party, listen to me y'all, every last one of you, Thumbs down. The group now that's calling themselves the New Black Panthers, zip. They, everything I talked about here to, to you tonight, their rhetoric is totally antithetical 
to what we stood for and what we were about. And these people openly call for the killing of innocent white people and even babies. You want freedom? You're gonna have to kill some crackers. You're gonna have to kill some of their babies. I hate white people. Every last iota of a cracker, I hate it. And yet there's no serious targeting or repercussions for them. And that's because the ruling class favor racism and division, but they fear us standing together and promoting unity. Now, some of you might be saying, well, what about Malcolm X? He was assassinated too. And in fact, the widely misunderstood case of Malcolm X is yet another perfect example. You see, during his younger years, when Malcolm X promoted racism and division, he was all over the media. And even to this day, his older and outdated views are constantly propagated throughout the internet. But it was only after he became disillusioned with the Nation of Islam's racist leader and started to think and speak for himself that he was targeted for assassination. Like Muhammad had taught us that the white man could not enter into Mecca in Arabia and all of us who followed him, we believed it. And he said the reason he couldn't enter was because he's white and inherently evil. It's impossible to change him. And uh, this is how he taught us. And, you know, and so when I got over there and went to Mecca and saw these people who blonde and blue eyed and pale skin and all those things, I said, well, when I was in on the pilgrimage, I had close contact with Muslims whose skin would in America be classified as white and with Muslims who would themselves would be classified as white in America. But these particular Muslims didn't call themselves white. They looked upon themselves as human beings, as part of the human family, and therefore they looked upon all other segments of the human family as part of that same family. I was eating from the same place with people who in America would be considered white whose hair was blonde, whose eyes were blue, and whose skin was white. There were black people, brown people, red people, yellow people, and white people. Every specimen of humanity was represented there. But the different complexions present only represented the different complexions that go to make up the human family. Not one being any better than the other, or one being any different from the other. And this is what I had to become aware of on my pilgrimage to Mecca. I could see then that there are many white people in this country who will side with the Negro in whatever he has to do to protect himself. You have changed your attitude about the white man in the United States to some extent. Well, I've broadened my scope. But that's a considerable change of opinion in Malcolm X. Today I'm speaking for myself. Formerly I spoke for Elijah Muhammad. And everything I said was, Elijah Muhammad teaches us thus and so. I'm speaking now from what I think, from what I have seen, from what I have analyzed and, and the conclusions that I have reached. And as Malcolm X began to use his own mind, he began to promote racial unity against a much greater global threat. In my opinion, the young generation of whites, blacks, brown, whatever else there is, you're living at a time of extremism, a time of revolution, a time when there's got to be a change. People in power have misused it, and now there has to be a change, and a better world has to be built, and the only way it's going to be built with, with, it, with, it, is with extreme methods. And I, for one, will join in with anyone don't care what color you are, as long as you want to change this miserable condition that exists on this earth. Thank you. So when we see this video of Julius Malema and the EFF going viral, we need to understand that the ruling class in fact wants to amplify and propagate this message for the greater purpose of divide and conquer. And this leads me to my final point. People like Julius Malema and the EFF, although thinking themselves to be revolutionaries, are incredibly easy for the ruling class to manipulate and deceive. During the so-called pandemic, for example, the EFF were protesting and demanding that everyone get Chinese and Russian COVID vaccines, as if these are somehow any less dangerous than the American and European vaccines. We want vaccine from China and from Russia provided in South Africa because we think those things are a solution. Likewise, they antagonize the average white person, but then on the other hand, they go ahead and defend and support the white Russian president, Vladimir Putin. We are with President Putin. We are Putin, and Putin is us. And that right there, guys, is a red flag, and a clear indication that Julius Malema and the EFF have no idea who the real enemy is. Because whether it's the Russian government or the South African government or the US government or the Chinese government or NATO or BRICS, all of these governments are exploiting and manipulating the common people. All of them are connected through the World Economic Forum. All of them impose their pseudo-scientific lockdowns and try to coerce their populations into taking their fast-track vaccines. 
and all of them are working on central banking digital currencies and digital identities. And if they get that right, they will have total control over our lives. Now, I doubt that Julius Malema and the EFF are aware of this much greater threat, just as most people around the world aren't either. And in this way, Malema, who has been involved in politics apparently since he was just a small boy, is what I call somebody who is a really good political checkers player. You see, from a young age, Malema saw this game of what he viewed as black and white checkers. He studied it and he got really good at it. But Malema and anybody else that needs to hear this, that thinks this is just a simple black and white game of checkers. The shit's chess, it ain't checkers. So for those of you that are becoming aware of this chess game, and are tired of being a pawn with a black or white, please share this video, make other people aware, because one of the primary weapons they use to divide and conquer us with is this race-baiting tribalism bullshit. But what they really fear is unity, because we are many and they are few. And once we figure that out, it's game over for them.